Welcome to presentation number 16 in our series, Re-Reading Revelation. We have reached <clears throat> ground zero, the cosmic conflict from A to Z. And that covers three chapters in the middle of the book of Revelation. <clears throat> we are doing part one of those three chapters today under the title, War in Heaven. And the passage is Revelation 12, verses 1 through 18. <clears throat> Looking at it like this, the cosmic conflict from A to C, part 1, uh, is uh, the title here. But these are, this is the A to Z part of it, three chapters. In chapter 12, the cosmic conflict in three parts already, a kind of summary <clears throat> So beginning in chapter 12 with the great sign, then the cosmic rebellion, and then the beginning of the end, already in one chapter. Chapter 13 <clears throat> uh, broadens or expands on the beginning of the end part, and the title there is The Dragon Acts. And we have the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth. Chapter 14, the title is God Reacts. And here we have the Lamb on Mount Zion. We have the three angels' messages. And we have <clears throat> the uh, passage about harvest, harvest time. So I have illustrations here. And you, <clears throat> this is for chapter 12 only. And you will notice that I have arranged these illustrations uh, somewhat different from the way they are arranged here. This is the narrative sequence. This is the actual sequence, <clears throat> beginning with the war in heaven, the cosmic conflict here, which is <clears throat> number two in the narrative sequence. And then we have <clears throat> the great sign, the woman who has a child. That's number one in the narrative sequence but it is number two in the actual sequence. <clears throat> we'll get it straight <clears throat> as we move, move through. And then we have uh, the story, the beginning of the end, the persecution of the woman who, bore, who had the child and what happens to her. So this is what we're doing now. <clears throat> the three parts and these <clears throat> passages, the great sign, the cosmic rebellion, and the beginning uh, of the end. <clears throat> and yes, this is ground zero. This is the chapter from which everything else <clears throat> radiates, exerting an influence upstream all the way to the beginning of the book, especially to chapter four, and certainly downstream all the way to chapter 20 and chapter 22 as well. <clears throat> so this is <clears throat> a critical chapter, and we're glad we have reached it <clears throat> finally. We have also called it the hub of the wheel, putting the cosmic conflict theme here in these three chapters, Revelation 12, 13, and 14, at the center as the hub of the wheel, and putting the letters, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the angels' messages, and the seven bowls, all of them in an immediate relationship to the cosmic conflict theme, not a distant relationship uh, that is often as it is often perceived. And here is an illustration that I discovered a new detail as late as, <coughs> as when I was preparing, pre preparing uh, uh, this presentation. We have seen this before. This is the scene in the heavenly council. The 24 elders are here. The four living creatures are here. And the lamb is in the middle. The lamb that was the resolution to the crisis in the heavenly council. But here is the detail. This is John. And he is looking through the open door into heaven, into the heavenly council. He is watching it. And guess what? 
that's where we are too. That's how revelation positions us. Everything we see from chapter 4 onwards is seen through that window. It's like we are watching a movie unfolding and the setting is the heavenly council. So here, let me highlight that. John looking into the heavenly council at the beginning of chapter 4 and the rest of the book is seen through that window. That has, uh, I have not seen an illustration as good as this one, and I'm sorry I didn't uh, pick it up uh, uh, as beautifully as it has been perceived and depicted by our artists in the Cambrai apocalypse. <clears throat> we do a little more <clears throat> of the same introductory matters. A center, more periphery, more periphery, more periphery. At the center, at ground zero, we have <clears throat> the war in heaven where the dragon acts and God reacts. It begins already there. We have the birth of the male child. In some ways we can say here God acts and the dragon reacts. At the end of the conflict, again, the dragon acts and God reacts. And the entire book, in some ways, could be seen as the story of the dragon who acts and God who reacts, and <clears throat> why God had to intervene in such a dramatic ways. <clears throat> Again, just looking at these chapters one last time before we start reading the chapter, uh, the text. Chapter twelve is here, the beginning of the conflict the decisive middle of the conflict, and the ending of the conflict. Using this illustration by <clears throat> William Blake about the fall of Satan, the fall of Lucifer uh, from grace and from heaven. Then we have chapter 13, it's simpler, the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth. And here again, another illustration by William Blake, this is Lucifer, this is the dragon calling up surrogates. This is the first surrogate, the beast from the sea. And then in chapter 14, <clears throat> arranged in the order of actual sequence rather than narrative sequence, message of the three angels in verses 6 to 12, end of the conflict in verses 13 to 20, and the Lamb on Mount Zion. That is the ultimate end, the victory of God's side in the cosmic conflict. And the picture here is that celebratory moment at the end with the Lamb standing on Mount Zion and the 144,000 and other victorious beings uh, celebrating at the end there. Well, this was a big introduction, but I hope it will pay off as we now move into the text. One way in which I want it to pay off is to connect these, these, uh, these chapters so as not to make the mistake, the mistake that many people make, that they read, say, chapter 14 in Revelation in isolation from the other chapters. And some people love the three angels' messages, and they read it without context. And if you do that, you will not get it right, no matter how much you love the three angels' messages. <clears throat> War in heaven, Lucifer's fall from innocence. And war burst forth in heaven. Michael and his angels had to fight against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought, but they were not strong enough, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. This is Albrecht Dürer's <coughs> illustration of the war in heaven. This is Michael defeating the dragon. And these are valuable images. This is a very famous illustration from Revelation. But they have a certain limitation, and let me point out what that limitation is. Here, the dragon is a very ugly being, a monstrous being, 
and this is a good being. But the dragon at the outset was not a monstrous being. At the outset, he was a very beautiful being and a good one too. So this one by William Blake, The Fall of Lucifer, looks at, <coughs> preserves a little more of the original beauty of the being who started the war. But <coughs> we need an even better one. This is again William Blake. This is Lucifer in his unfallen state as the most spectacular, the most, the most um, winsome being God had ever made. Ezekiel in his poem calls him the standard of beauty by which beauty is measured. And this is not easily captured in illustrations. So <clears throat> let's look at the text again. War burst forth in heaven. Michael and his angels had to fight against the dragon. Who started it? It wasn't Michael and his angels. It was the other side that started it. And Michael reacted to a, an initiative to discontent, to problems initiated by, by the dragon, by Lucifer. And then again, because these are uh, cast in military terms, we should tone down the military connotation and rather play up the connotation of a disagreement. That <clears throat> because the, the word war, war burst forth, is the word polemos or polemos, the word from which polemics is derived in, in English. So a disagreement arose in heaven and Michael had to fight against it, against the viewpoint that was expressed. And then the, dra the dragon fought for their point of view, but they did not have a good case. And so their paths diverged, they separated. There was no longer any place for them in heaven because they were holding a point of view that didn't have, uh, didn't resonate as it were. Toning down the military side, playing up the actual sort of re reality as it were in this conflict. And here in the Trinity Apocalypse, we have a composite of it. Again, you see Michael fighting the dragon. It is uh, <coughs> cast in military terms somewhat. And of course, we are not seeing the dragon or seeing Lucifer in his unfallen state, which is still hard to do. <coughs> the background text again, we have visited this part earlier, we'll do it again. It's the story of the of this great star, the fall of the great star, as it is depicted in uh, the book of Isaiah in chapter 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O most brilliant star. This text remembers who he was, the most, the star that you can see in daylight. That is kind of connotation. That's how brilliant the star is. Son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the heavenly council, on the heights of the far north. I will rise up <clears throat> to the top of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. This is a kind of, uh, you said in your heart, this is something that the prophet knows that the other person was thinking, even though it may not have been fully expressed. And we have here uh, a, an attempt to illustrate the, the drama in, in, in a visual way. And then <clears throat> this one, but you are brought down to Hades, to the utmost depths of the death hole. That's the, 
brief, the sort of a compressed version of the story that we are now seeing echoing in the book of Revelation in chapter 12. <clears throat> I have called it irreconcilable differences. We do not just want to construe this conflict as a conflict fought in the realm of power where the side that is most powerful wins. We want to <clears throat> see it more as irreconcilable differences where the losing side doesn't have a good case. It is the weakness of their case and the charges against God <clears throat> that should be foregrounded. The great dragon was thrown down. That ancient serpent who is called the slanderer, the abolus, and the adversary, Hosatanas, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. So here we have terms, of course, that highlight the characteristics of the opposing side. And, for example, the notion of the abolus that <coughs> has the connotation of slanderer, the mudslinger. The mudslinger was thrown down. The one whose specialty is to misrepresent someone. That's what we are seeing here. And in the Deuce Apocalypse, we see the, the, be, uh, the dragon here being thrown down. But we are now putting on glasses as we look at this so as not to simply see a military conflict here. <clears throat> and uh, this may be a little uh, better here, a little less, less um, uh, uh, violent, you might see, but again, there is the overcoming of Lucifer. And the background text <coughs> in this passage is clearly indebted, or uh, this text is indebted to uh, to uh, Genesis, chapter 3 in Genesis. The serpent was more shrewd than any other wild animal the Lord God had made. So here we have a serpent, and we have a serpent playing a critical role in trying to make humans see God in a different light. Has God really said, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden. That's what the serpent will say, trying to portray God as, a, as an unreasonable being, as an unreasonable person, as a harsh person. That would be severe, wouldn't it? And then later in the text, we see God coming on the scene. <clears throat> then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. These are elements then when Revelation says the ancient serpent. That's the serpent. And when Re Revelation calls him the deceiver of the whole world, that's what Eve calls him too. He deceived me. So there are the parameters uh, lining up. And the story then that comes to light here in Genesis is the story of the temptation and fall, the misrepresentation of God here. And this is the story that grounds Revelation's depiction here in the cosmic conflict. Genesis and Revelation know each other, or Revelation knows the story in Genesis. And I have two illustrations here. These are William Blake's embellishments of what happened there, uh, the serpent and the woman here in, in evocative depictions. And here the woman is defeated. She lies defeated on the ground. And the serpent is kind of uh, uh, wound around her. And there is a sense of triumph on the part of the deceiver. So these are, uh, <clears throat> these are uh, uh, nice, uh, very valuable depictions of the figure that Revelation calls the ancient serpent. 
then I and then we move from uh, from Lucifer's fall from innocence to his fall from influence. That is the next one. And then I heard a loud voice in heaven proclaiming, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. This is how the antagonist is represented in relation to the believers and in, bela in relation to heaven uh, too. And now he has been thrown down, not only physically, now he has been also thrown down in the sense of losing his influence. And the image here about him being thrown down in, in William Blake's depiction, but this one, even better, in the Deuce Apocalypse, he has been thrown down by, from influence by something that happened here. And this is the lamb that is killed with violence. And here the dragon is sort of slinking away, sort of disappearing uh, in a body language of the loser. He won. I lost. That's the uh, connotation here. <clears throat> and the text, how the war was won, is here. But they have won over him by the blood of the Lamb that was killed by violence, and by the word of their testimony, for they did not cling to life even in the face of death. Rejoice then, you heavens, and those who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you with great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. So this is quite demanding because we have images that are so images of events that are separate in time, now brought together in, in almost like in one picture, the cosmic conflict way back there, the incarnation and death of Jesus here, the persecution of the believers at the end of the story. But all of it is in some ways brought together in, 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 in uh, images that are not so separate. I'm going to try to, to illustrate this and explain it uh, uh, using terms that others have <coughs> taught me and uh, I think are useful. So here is a telescope. A telescope makes it possible to see objects that are very distant uh, and see them close and see them in detail. So they bring a faraway object closer. Notice that I am calling this temporal telescoping. This is not then telescoping in space. I'm talking about it's telescoping in time, but I'm using a spatial uh, illustration. <clears throat> so we look through the telescope and we see this uh, image, I suppose, this is the surface of the moon, and the earth looks very close. And so it's very hard to say how far away the earth is. You know, it might be if he reaches out his hand, he can touch it, who knows. <clears throat> there is clarity of images, but there is distortion of distance. That, you know, distance is not the same. <clears throat> and here is a then if we had positioned the camera uh, uh, over here, so we would have seen this figure superimposed on the earth, that would have been even better for the type of illustration I'm trying to make. Here I have that kind of illustration. We have a soup, uh, images superimposed on each other, and they are obviously separate images, separate places. But when we put them together and overlap them like this, we get to see relationships that are relevant, but that are in some ways also distortions. <clears throat> so there is a scientific term for what we're looking at here. Someone talks about forwards telescoping, events move from past to the middle, you know, here, 
and backwards telescoping events move from the present to the middle. So there is a distortion in, in both directions. <clears throat> well, let me try to apply this in a way to Revelation 12. In primordial time, we have the fall from innocence, Lucifer's fall from innocence. And then in the middle of time, we have Lucifer's fall from influence. That happens with the violent death of Jesus, the lamb that was killed with violence. That's when Lucifer falls from influence. And then we have the end of time, and that is Lucifer's fall from relevance, that he falls into oblivion. He will, in the end, disappear. So temporally, of course, Primordial time, middle of time, end of time, that's a logical temporal sequence. And these are events separate in time corresponding to the temporal sequence, the sequence in time. You wish Revelation had done it that way, but it doesn't. It does it and it doesn't. Hear it, what's what Revelation does. Primordial time, yes, that notion is preserved. But the middle of time kind of merges with that arrow. It kind of blurs a little. I keep them separate more than Revelation does. And the end of time, yes, you have them still. Primordial time, middle of time, end of time. But they have in some ways come together on one timeline. And then look at what happens to the rest of it. The fall from innocence happens here in primordial time. But in some ways, Revelation moves it toward the middle. The fall from influence happens here in the middle of time. That's easy. But the fall from relevance also is kind of put into the middle. There is a tendency in Revelation to center all these images, even though they are separate in time. And even <clears throat> for this one, the fall from relevance at the end, of the story here, they have won over him by the blood of the lamb that was killed with violence and by the word of their testimony. I hope this is helpful and <clears throat> we will now move on to the second panel. So <clears throat> we have three sections in the book of Revelation, fall from innocence, fall from influence, fall from relevance. And they are separate, and there is a sequence, but there is a tendency to blur them. We are now going to, we have covered this one now, Fall from Innocence. Now we're going to do Fall from Influence. <clears throat> and we are reading in Revelation 12, 1 to 6, the woman and her child. A great portent appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her, heart, uh, on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pangs in the agony of giving birth. And this is <coughs> the Jews' apocalypse illustrating the woman. She is dressed in the sun. She is a splendid uh, person, a very important person. And the being dressed in the sun makes her a figure of revelation, sort of the blazing of daylight coming forth here around her. She has the moon under her feet and she has 12 stars and she is pregnant. And that's what we have seen in the beginning of the text. And another portent appeared in heaven, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads, his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. So this is clearly the figure we have seen already, the war in heaven figure. And here we are told a detail that actually belongs to what happened primordially. primordially that his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven. But this is what I meant by temporal telescoping. 
uh, in the previous <coughs> explanation. So here in Albrecht <coughs> Dürer's illustration, there is the woman, the pregnant woman, the 12 stars on her head, the moon under her feet, dressed in the sun, and the dragon now poised to do whatever he can to neutralize, to damage, to impair the event that is going to take place, the birth of the child. And then, <coughs> the uh, just since I have the picture now, there the child has been born and is carried away to heaven. So it signals <coughs> that the dragon didn't succeed. Well, we haven't read the text for that yet. Uh, here is uh, uh, William Blake's depiction of the scene, the dragon confronting the pregnant woman in her state of vulnerability. That's what we are seeing here. And this is Martin Leonard in a modern illustration, the dragon and the pregnant woman in contemporary uh, art. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to bear a child so that he might devour her child as soon as it was born. Those of us who have read the Gospels, we will recognize what happens, that there is historical uh, verisim verisimilitude, that it, <coughs> it captures what happened when Jesus was born. And she gave birth to a son a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was snatched away and taken to God and to his throne. We know there is more to the story about the child, but now Revelation compresses it to say that the dragons attempt to do the child in. That attempt failed. And the woman who had given birth, she fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God. And <clears throat> here is one ancient illustration here. I think this is the Getty Apocalypse. But you see the dragon, you see the woman, you see how the baby is sort of gently handed over to heaven to be kept. We know that the baby story is more complicated than this. But there is a kind of endearing, endearing uh, 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 message in the way this is depicted. Here is the tale of the serpent, the trail of the dragon, and it is a serpentine tail pulling down one third of the stars of heaven. And <clears throat> then <clears throat> to go to textual background here, this part of the story is also told in Genesis, not just ancient serpent, but this part of the defeat of the serpent is also told in Genesis. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you among all, the, all animals and among all wild creatures, upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Who will win? The seed of the woman. He will win. That's what is uh, predicted here. And <clears throat> to the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. In pain you shall bear, uh, uh, bring forth children. And we have read in our text in Revelation, a woman who cries out in birth pangs, echoing Genesis, who brings forth this child, the child of the ages, an event at the maternity ward of the ages. That's what Revelation has depicted in such beautiful ways here. <clears throat> and uh, we can return to this or look at this illustration, the same thing, the dragon, the stars, and the woman handing her baby for safekeeping in heaven, as it were. And in the Jews' apocalypse, same thing. These artists, they really do a very nice job of showing that the dragons attempt to neutralize the child of the woman. It failed. <coughs> Trinity Apocalypse, we like to conclude with that because they are so panoramic. 
the dragon, the woman, the moon, the sun, the stars, and the handing over of, handing over of the baby. Uh, that's all captured here. We are now ready for the third part and the final part of <coughs> Revelations, the chapter 12, the ground zero of the entire book, the beginning of the end. So when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman, he persecuted her, who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle, so that she could fly from the serpent into the wilderness, to her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time. And here we have a picture of this. The dragon is pursuing the woman. She is giving the wings of the eagle and she is brought into a, a, a place of uh, safety, as it were, away from the dragon in a secure position. And the text that comes to mind here is Elijah. It's the story of Elijah who flees King Ahab into the wilderness and is nourished by God for a certain period of time, preserved there. Let's read the text in the Old Testament. <clears throat> God talks, or the messenger of God talks to Elijah. Go from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the Wadi Cherith, which is east of, Jord of the Jordan. You shall drink from the Wadi, uh, and uh, uh, I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to uh, the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the Wadi Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the Wadi. Well, this is the picture of Elijah brought into safety. Elijah is one of the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. And an Elijah-like figure, the woman now as an Elijah-like figure, is brought to safety in the wilderness. It's uh, quite consistent. The images fit us. But there are two more Old Testament texts that bear on the subject. This is in the relation to Israelites and Moses. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. The woman was given the wings of the eagle. That's to say she was equipped with wings, but the connotation in the Bible is that the, the one who carries the woman to safety is God himself. I carried you on eagles' wings. I brought you to myself. That's the connotation here. And then in Deuteronomy, this text, uh, this is from the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy. He sustained him in a desert land, in a howling wilderness waste. He shielded him, cared for him, guarded him as the apple of his eye. These are dispositions of God in relation to human beings, in, belief, in relation to the believing community. And a composite here again, what we are seeing, the dragon with the persecution and the eagle's wings here and fleeing to safety. <clears throat> then from his mouth, the serpent poured water like a river after the woman to sweep her away with the flood. And we have an illustration of this from the Cambrai apocalypse, the serpent pouring water, uh, after the woman, but the earth opens its mouth and the woman is brought to safety. She is not uh, harmed by it. And, and we see that also in the text. The earth came to the help of the woman. It opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from its mouth. <coughs> is there text in the Old Testament for this? Yes, there is. <coughs> in Psalms, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when our enemies attacked us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. 
then over us would have gone the raging waters. If God had not helped us, we would have perished. That's the same image here. Revelation explains later about these waters. Uh, in chapter 17, the waters that you saw where the whore is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. So we are seeing in some ways real human beings here uh, seeking to <clears throat> annihilate the woman who is fleeing. And she represents the believing community. There is no uh, doubt about that. Uh, and here a, a couple of texts uh, earlier, uh, from earlier in the Bible about how the earth is a participant in what God is doing in the world. Uh, here Cain has killed Abel and God has taken notice <clears throat> and says to Cain, you are cursed from the ground which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. The earth opened its mouth to receive the blood of the brother. But the earth is a kind of caring figure. The earth is in some ways acting as a kind of, uh, it, is, uh, it is kind of given, given personality, as though it, it receives kindly the blood of the victim. When you till the ground, the earth is now your enemy. It will no longer yield to you its strength you will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. That the earth is on God's side, as it were here. <clears throat> and then there is another uh, uh, passage in Leviticus, no, in Numbers chapter 16, where there is a showdown between Moses and his critics who are against him. And then God tells them, <clears throat> but if the Lord creates something new, and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into Sheol, then you shall know that these men have despised the Lord. As soon as he finished speaking these words, the ground under them was split apart. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up, along with their households, everyone who belonged to Korah and all their goods. So, these images here about the earth participating as a protecting element, as safe space, as a record keeper too of what has happened, and as a kind of you know protecting, protecting uh, force. All of those things uh, come together here. Uh, in the Cambrai apocalypse, we have seen this already. The river is swallowed up, the woman escapes. <clears throat> and here in the Angers Apocalypse, same thing, pouring water after the woman and the earth opening its mouth. Those are beautiful images. Okay, we have one more text in Revelation 12. The dragon went away. <clears throat> then the dragon was furious with the woman and went away to make war on the rest of her children those who keep the commandments of God as revealed by the testimony of Jesus. And the artists are struggling with this one. The Angers Apocalypse, this is its illustration, the dragon pursuing and persecuting the seed of the women, and they fight back. But there is no evidence of that in the text. The text depicts the pursuer, not the response to his pursuit. So in some ways, our illustrations are not entirely successful here. Here again, the dragon is persecuting and they are defending themselves. That isn't quite in the text. And same thing here in the Trinity Apocalypse. The dragon is fighting, persecuting, harassing, and they are in some ways fighting back, which fits a combat motif, but not exactly the text. What is in the text? <clears throat> we want to examine this term, I'm sorry, here. The dragon went away. What does that mean? And I am reading now from uh, a dic dictionary. This is the word going away, ab echumai. Motion away from a reference point with emphasis upon the departure but without implication as to any resulting state of separation or rupture, 
to go away, to depart, to leave, but not to tell you where you went, to disappear. That's what the dragon is done, doing. The dragon disappears and continues warfare in a, in a different sort of mode. And this is a carefully made illustration here. This is the dragon, and look at what he is doing. I must hide my tracks. He is making himself invisible. He is going to uh, do something different. And then the target of the war, the target of the war here, the dragon was furious with the woman and went away to make war on the rest of her seat. Those who keep the commandments of God as revealed by the testimony of Jesus. This is a very important phrase, a, two, a phrase with two elements all the way through the book of Revelation. The word of God as revealed by the testimony of Jesus in chapter 1, verse 2. The word of God as revealed by the testimony of Jesus, 1, chapter, verse 9. The word of God as revealed by the testimony of Jesus, 6, 9. Revelation likes this phrase. The commandments of God as revealed by the testimony of Jesus, 12, 17. That's where we are now. The commandments of God as revealed by the faithfulness of Jesus, 14, 12. And one more, the testimony of Jesus and the word of God. So all across here we have the word of God or the commandments of God in relation to how God has been revealed in the testimony of Jesus. The dragon goes away and vanishes. Sorry, he goes away and vanishes. But his target means the same. He needs to to sever. He needs to separate the connection between the commandments of God and the revelation of God in Jesus. That's what we are seeing. <clears throat> well, observations now at ground zero in Revelation. And here is a composite of the story in chapter 12. At Revelation's ground zero, the whole story is told. Lucifer falls from influence, from innocence then from influence, and then in the end from relevance, brought to oblivion. There is temporal telescoping and conflation of images, images on top of each other. But it is the event in the middle that commands greatest, greater attention. The child that is born and <clears throat> they have won over him by the blood of the Lamb, uh, that's the, the uh, centering. <clears throat> and so here, <clears throat> the, the image that is centered here is that image where the dragon is defeated by the revelation of God, the testimony of Jesus, the faithfulness of Jesus, the lamb that was killed with violence. That's how the dragon is defeated. The antagonist in the conflict is called the ancient serpent and the deceiver. He is a figure who knows how to talk. And it pays to pay attention to what he says. And we have this uh, memory from uh, the Garden of Eden. The lamb won the war by defeating the serpent's misrepresentation of God. The misrepresentation was trounced defeated by the revelation of God. And again, this picture that is the sort of summarizing, how is the dragon defeated? And we will have more about that in the rest of the book. The dragon's goal in the war is to sever the connection between the word of God and the testimony of Jesus and silence the witness that understands that connection. You need to neutralize that. You need to take the testimony of Jesus out of the equation and somehow subvert it. And that's my last point here. When the dragon goes away, he goes underground. He makes himself invisible. He adopts a strategy of concealment and surrogacy instead of a strategy of confrontation. 
he tried the strategy of confrontation. It didn't work. So he will resort to another strategy and try to sever the testimony of Jesus from the story to kind of neutralize that. That will be the topic in chapter 13.